Hello, everyone. Welcome to week four. Um, I am about to do our slideshow overview for the week. So first here we have an artwork by Wangeshi Mutu, who's Nigerian American. And we can see that there appears to be two girls, oops, or young women here. And Wangeshi Mutu is an internationally exhibiting artist. This week, some major overarching themes I want you to think about are Black voice, Black female voice, Black girl voice, Black woman voice, Black feminine voice. And so what does that sound like? Who, what's being said to whom and what for, for what purposes? How is it being said? In Black traditions such as the arts, creative expression, everyday resistance, Black radical tradition, sisterhood, and this week, we're looking at three genres. Well, we have um, some examples from three genres, and that's literature, the blues, and jazz. We are also going to think about taboos, societal taboos, and what happens when you, make, when you do something that is a creative expression or an artwork or some type of art around a taboo. And how does that relate to politics of respectability? And so what does that mean to you? I mean, just trying to guess what it means, politics of respectability. Well, within African-American history, it has been a kind of strategy towards trying to eradicate or resist racism. And so what that traditionally has meant has been behaving in ways that white people find acceptable. Um, for example, dressing in suits and very perfect clothing when going to protest. And so um, one of the things that's changed in the past uh, 60 years is that due to the civil rights movement, um, people saw that they would get sick with dogs and um, water hosed and killed even in their best clothing. And so politics of respectability is something that is still considered, but it's not as significant as it has been in the past in African-American tradition of resistance. And then there's this so, sort of like um, everyday colloquialism expression, airing the dirty laundry. And so there are some people within the Black community who feel that, again, because of politics of respectability, that artwork should, artwork should not show things that are bad about Black culture. And so again, this is kind of not necessarily outdated, but it does come into play when it comes into aesthetics what's good and what's beautiful about making art. Some people feel that art should be always uplifting and telling the beautiful parts of life. And so we see this artwork here by Carl Walker and it's telling the dirty history of American genetics and essentially American genetics, family structure and in a way how African-Americans bodies have been used um, as a result of being enslaved. And so, Kara uh, Walker is most famous for her antebellum themed artwork. So antebellum is before the Civil War. And so she um, explores a lot of the themes of sexual assault, sexual violence against Black bodies during that era. It's not always just those things. Sometimes there's a little bit of pleasure to it, but it's definitely uncomfortable and controversial. So the main thing that you're doing this week is reading Half of the Bluest Eye. And it's um, not that big of a book. I don't know if you can see that this is not that big of a book. It's not even half an inch thick. And um, I chose this cover because uh, this is the cover of all the ones that I've seen that I preferred the best. And even when I purchased the book, I purchased the one, this cover, because I felt like it really best um, talked about the themes that are in the book. And so questions for thought while reading. Um, we have a main character named Popola Breedlove. Um, and she, she is described as ugly. And so what does that mean in her small town, which is predominantly black? What does it mean for this young black girl to be ugly? And what are her possibilities in life? And how does she feel about herself and how do other people feel about her? And then there's another girl named Maureen who is contrasted as being very pretty, even cute. And so she's also a black girl. So, you know, one of the things I want you to think about when you're reading is 
what's the difference between these two girls? What are the characteristics? So we can also see that Toni Morrison is receiving a Medal of Honor here. It's the higher, highest Medal of Honor that civilians can receive in the United States. And so she won that for um, this recognition for her literature. The Bluest Eye was actually her first novel and it was not very well received when it first came out. Um, people didn't think you should be writing about some of the topics that she was writing about, um, that is black people or white people. So um, it took a long time for the public to turn around to her work and take an interest in this particular novel, which um, some school districts around the United States require as um, or it's required reading in some school districts, but it's also on the top most censored or banned books in the United States as well for the public school system. Um, so I want you to think about some concepts such as code switching, versatility, agility, improvisation, realness, soulfulness, and sassiness. And I want you to, con and going back to agility, as you can see here, it says, intellectual and physical. So I'd like for you to consider these as um, aesthetic characteristics of that are considered beautiful for Black women, for Black people too. But when we get to the part about sassiness, that becomes truly a Black a term, an adjective to describe Black women within Black culture often. And so there's a video that you can watch where you can see the history of social dancing. It's just a general overview of the history of Black social dancing in the United States. And that's fun to watch. It's very short. Um, again, for your consideration, I didn't put this in the in this week's um, things um, for you to, I think I'm gonna, I haven't made the um, uh, additional optional things for you to see and view. So I think I'll add this one in. It's called Just a Little Thick by Trina Jad Dames with Mystical and Lil Dicky. And so the whole song and the video highlights big, beautiful Black women. And so it's kind of fun to think about that and, and that being a major difference sometimes in the way um, Black women's bodies look compared to white women's bodies. And this is a book that uh, I recommend. It is written by an African-American woman who was the first woman of color, of any color, to be tenured at Yale University. during. And this was during the 1970s, I think she was tenured. And she did some field research in Africa within the Mende, the Mende ethnic group, which is in Sierra Leone. Um, it, it may extend a little bit beyond Sierra Leone, but that's where she went. So it says here, Radiance from the Waters, Ideals of Feminine Beauty in Mende Art. So the whole entire book is her asking questions of the people in Black Africa, West Africa, what makes a woman beautiful? And she dissects every single part of what can make a woman beautiful. Eyebrows, eyes, lips, nose, buttocks, breast, um, belly, um, speech, walk. I mean, there's so many different aspects to it. Virtues, it, it goes on. So it's a fun book to read. And so for the history of African-American women uh, who are the descendants of those who were enslaved, um, that is here in the United States and not just African-American women, but people, women of African descent in the Black Atlantic, we have had to deal with this tradition. We have had to go up against these images and expectations and um, caricatures of Black women, these exaggerations. So historical depictions of Black women could be ugly, disgusting, ignorant, bestial, servile, asexual, or overly sexual, and often lacking, lacking complexity and honor. We have to encounter this for Black girls as well. So it's a tradition that Black girls have been treated with the same types of um, meanness as black, grown Black women have. And so another term that I want you to know about is colorism, and it's a global aspect of racism. So you can go ahead and read this definition, and um, you can go to this website right here, and the, actually where, this is where the definition comes from, and you can find out more information, including statistics of how people view people who are light-skinned Black, versus dark skin black. So I'm gonna play a video right now. Let's see if it will play. 
It's from a TV show called Blackish. And we're going to find out what colorism means um, as uh, with, uh, through a video that's within the episode. It's a short clip. My daughter was not lit properly in the class photo and someone decided to print it anyway. Yeah, it's gonna be a fight. All right, let me give you a little context. Black people come in many shades, from Mariah Carey to Wesley Snipes. Because we look different, we get discriminated against differently. Like in the case of OJ, a magazine made his skin look darker to make him seem more villainous. And sadly, it's not just done to us, like with the are you darker than a brown paper bag test. Sometimes we even discriminate against each other. It's called colorism. The racist belief that light skin is good and dark skin is bad. But it's not just us. People are color struck all around the world. In Asian communities, some people use umbrellas and visors to avoid the sun. In Indian communities, some dark skin actors say they have trouble starring even in Bollywood movies. And in the Latin community, products that bleach your skin are becoming increasingly popular. But with black Americans, people believe colorism was the brainchild of a slave owner named Willie Lynch, who taught other slave owners how to control us by dividing us by color. Turns out, the story of Willie Lynch is a hoax. But it felt real because of the fact that slave owners did divide us by color, putting dark slaves in the field and light slaves in the house. This separation caused deep-seated tension and resentment that continues to this day. The resentment is so great that it makes us hypersensitive to issues of complexion, which brings us back to this. It's going to be a fight! Yeah, we okay, so what you saw there is a kind of overview of the history of colorism in, in the United States. And just understand that in the United States, um, what the way that the system was set up is that one drop of blackness or any evidence of a black ancestor would make you black. But in certain other countries, the opposite was something, not the opposite, but some another system was um, what manifested. So in Brazil, for example, if you have one white ancestor, for example, then you would be considered more white than you could then you might be black. And so because uh, in Brazil, the Portuguese were always a minority compared to the African population, they came up with a different system of privileging those who have white blood as opposed to those who had one drop of black blood, blood being the ones who would be um, put down. So this is an expression right here an African-American folkloric saying, I heard it when I was a child. I even heard Obama talk about it and how it was something that we needed to get beyond. If you're white, you all right. If you brown, stick around. If you black, get back. And this is a very simple folkloric singing, saying that really breaks down how race is also a caste system in, around the world now. So um, ask yourself these questions here. What comes to mind if someone asks you, what are some European white ideals of beauty? Thinking globally, which peoples of the world are phenotypically closest to these ideals? Here's an artwork by Janet E. Dandridge. Um, as a consequence of European colonialism and imperialism, European ideals of beauty infect global cultures. Every woman, and the global culture is affected by this, these ideals now in the United that um, as a result of what's happened in the last 500 years with this transatlantic slave trade and racism. And it's not just women who are affected by it, it's men too. So in this novel, Imperium in Imperio, Sutton E. Griggs, an African-American novelist, was also a preacher. Uh, he writes about two boys who are black, one light skin and one black, and how um, they are pretty much equally intellectual in the classroom from the time that they're children, but how their lives have different obstacles because one is light skin black and one is different and one is dark skin black. Basically, how society, including his teacher, uh, the teachers, the students, um, other people involved in the education system, and then beyond that would put down the, the dark-skinned Black man or limit his options in life compared to the light-skinned Black man. 
And then when we talk about phenotypes, other terms come to mind, white beauty, black denigration, eugenics. And so Europeans came up with lots of ways of um, justifying through science racism. And so that included making pictures that denigrated blackness, black skin, black features. And as you can see here, these images equate black people to monkeys and gorilla and therefore primitive or savages as white people often call them. So I just wonder, I want you to ask yourself, have you ever looked at someone? Have we ever looked at, in, at someone and thought how sad that they don't love themselves? Have we ever felt shame for them? Have we considered ourselves more woke than um, some other people who are doing things to their body to make themselves more white? Would we think that they're brainwashed, self-hating, suffering from self-hatred and ambiguity, that they're being too white, that they're exhibiting self-destructiveness and antisocial behaviors? Uh, bleaching creams might be something that, that's something that came up in the video just now, but it's also something that people observe around the world in certain places. These happen to be products in Africa that are used to try to make the skin lighter. But from what I hear from people, you can always tell that someone's using bleaching cream a lot because their skin color on their face looks unnatural, but it doesn't match like their neck and their hands, for example. Or maybe they have colored contacts that are just obviously really, really fake looking. And so what do we think when we look at those people? Are, are there certain people that we look at and when they're wearing contacts, we think that they're trying to be too white? In this case, we see Lupita Nyong'o and she's like a famous actress that was in Black Panther. Um, she was uh, raised in Mexico, but African. And we see that she has yellow contacts here and that's all for an effect that she's supposed to look like, you know, strange and like a monster. But that may be how some people view someone like Kanye West who puts in blue contacts. There are some other people who would look at him and think, why are you doing that? Yes, there are black people who naturally have blue eyes, but why would you try and have them on purpose? And so when we look at the book, The Bluest Eye, which is titled The Bluest Eye, why does Pecola Breedlove want blue eyes? What does that symbolize for her? When we think about someone like Beyonce, we know that she's Black, African-American, and very Black identified. However, she's almost always in blonde hair, sandy colored, light colored blonde hair, and it's long. And so when we think about that, what if we knew the statistics of how much more money she will make and how much more culturally acceptable she is around in the United States and around the world because she's light-skinned. Think about it. Would a dark-skinned woman like this one beside her with the Afro, if she sang and danced exactly the same, it's sad to know that statistically speaking, the data shows that she would not be as popular or make as much money as Beyonce if everything were equal, just based on their looks. And they can be equally beautiful but just different complexions and hair textures. That's how powerful that is, the standards of beauty, that it makes a difference in the quality of one's life, how much money they make, if they can get a, a loving partner to stay with them, and many other things in life. And besides it affecting heterosexual Black women, it also affects um, trans people or LGBT people, LGBTQ. So for example, this is Venus Extravaganza, Extravaganza and she is a person, a trans person featured in a 1980s documentary that became really, really a classic. And the TV show that is on Netflix called Pose is somewhat a spinoff of Paris is Burning and that's the name of the documentary. And so um, Venus is actually a Puerto Rican and Italian person. She, by some people's standards, she'd be considered white by many Black people, possibly. But, but for her, she's not white. And so she says, um, one of her lines in the, in the documentary is, I would like to be a spoiled, rich, white girl. And so we think about that in 
just continue to think about it. And then there are Black women who get forgotten or not recognized as much. So why does that happen? Forgotten, not getting their dues. Here's Ethel Waters. We see her in a kind of sexy, beautiful pose here. And then we see her fully clothed here. America's foremost ebony comedian. So she was a singer and entertainer, and she was one of the most popular, probably like one of the first black female celebrities ever in the United States to get worldwide attention. So you're gonna be listening to a song sung by her. And you're gonna to listen to a song sung by Sarah Vaughn. You can see two different images here. I included two different images for a couple different reasons. But one of the major reasons is because here you can see that she, you can't really see what her complexion is as easily as you can here, that she was a dark skinned black woman. And so I wanted you to see the difference in what photography can make and how in the past, a lot of photographers tried to make dark skin or darker skin black actresses look lighter skin to make them more appealing to white people and to black people. So there, it's beyond the, the course for me, the boundaries of the course for me to spend a whole lot of time describing blues and jazz, but just understand that there's genres and they're also aesthetic concepts. So different types of artists and writers try to manifest the concept of blues or bluesy in what they do or jazz and jazzy in what they do, like in painting or in fashion, for example, in song, in, in um, music and in song. And so um, the Library of Congress has a, some pretty good definitions of um, African-American musical genres. So you can go there and look up blues and jazz. And you can also look up um, a definition of gospel music and find out about its origins. And when you watch the Clark Sisters video and the um, hey, uh, I forgot his name, Reverend Hayes choir um, video, work it out. I want you to be looking for something called call and response. And that is basically when uh, um, a singer, for example, or a speaker uh, says something or sings something and then waits for the audience to respond. It means the audience is, there's the line between the audience and the performer is blurred. It means that the audience participates as well. So you're going to be listening to how the choir responds to the singer and how the choir and the singer interact with the musicians and they talk to each other through the singing and through the instruments and then also how they're responding. So there's a dynamic interaction of cross conversation, which we can think of as jazz. And that's what happens with musical instruments. And if you listen to groups of um, black people talking sometimes, you'll notice the same thing is happening in conversations, that people are talking all at once, that it's very dynamic and constantly moving and adjusting. If there's a group of people, often there's side conversations. Sometimes someone stands out and talks. I mean, all, many people do this, but we, what we're wanting to notice is how this contributes to, it comes from an aesthetic um, um, ideal and that it manifests itself in, in African-American creative expression in different ways. So improvisation is something that's been highly valued in African-American culture for a lot of different reasons. It def definitely, all of these things that I've listed here, call and response, improvisation, testifying, the blues, all of these have a tradition that comes from different places in West Africa and it was brought here. And then the circumstances um, that happen here Black people here in the United States were able to call on these aesthetics and use them to talk about their experience here, to heal themselves, um, and um, to entertain themselves. And so um, improvisation has a, a, a function, again, that comes originally from Africa with, with a set of African aesthetics that Black people conform to in a certain way or, you know, um, innovate. But at the same time, improvisation has been very important to survival here in the United States. Coming to a country where they didn't speak the language maybe, or didn't know the culture, didn't know the religion, didn't understand the foods, had a lack of power in the society, that being ready to improvise would be extremely important to one's survival. Um, I, testifying, let me go back. Testifying is just talking about your experience and doing so in um, creative settings such as prayer, rituals, and music, for example, would give 
people an opportunity, Black people an opportunity who are suffering to share what's happening in their lives and have it validated by their community, have them help them problem solve, have them, have them help to keep them sane. And then the blues, we can, we can equate that to um, suffering in some way, but the blues can be used in a lot of ways. It is a synonym for suffering, but then it's also um, a type of music as, as stated before, which you can go look up and there's so many examples all over the internet. Just understand that um, if you're reading something that says that it was invented by white people, then it's a wrong source. That would be wrong. Blues and jazz and gospel are all genres that were invented by Black Americans. Um, so yeah, going back to the Library of Congress, Library of Congress has a pretty good definition, an introductory definition to gospel music. And so just going back to the bluest eye and thinking about that, um, the movie, in the movie Color Purple, there's a scene where Suge and Seely um, there are many scenes with them, but this image comes from a scene where Suge is trying to give Celie some self-esteem. Um, Suge tells Celie that she's beautiful and what's beautiful about her and it starts to change Celie's life. And so Suge is lighter skinned and more popular and beautiful. She's an internationally traveling singer in the United States. She's diva. Um, what is it that makes Suge so diva and so beautiful, but Celie so not beautiful? How does Celie feel about herself that reinforces this for everyone who looks at her? Is it the low self-esteem? So Suge helps Celie come out of this low self-esteem by telling her what's beautiful about her. In this photography um, series by Carrie Mae Weems, she photographs Mary J. Blige. And so, um, what I want you to think about is how this week you, as Carrie May Weems says here at the bottom, you engaged in the critical act of looking. And so that's what you're gonna be doing this week, the critical act of looking. And you're gonna be looking around you at the world that you know and understand and looking at it critically as well. And so I want you to consider this. There were multiple levels of societal, community, and family failures that produced the tragedy in the bluest eye. How could the outcome have been different? How could Pecola breed love have been saved? So these are actually questions for this week and next week. So understand that you're looking at the development of a community and how a tragedy happened as you read this novel. And that's the end of the overview for this week. Thank you.